Um, let me just summarize what uh, we have seen uh, so far, or some of the things that we have seen so far. So, the mic our microscopic theory, our uh, theory of everything, if you want, is Schrodinger equation that describes the interaction between two identical particles of mass m. We go to the center of mass, and it effectively becomes an equation for a single separation, as like if it was a single particle in a potential v. And this is Schrodinger equation. And then this potential v that depends on the separation between the two particles, that's now it's the single variable, can be of three types. Can be ultra-local, local, or uh, finite range, but longer, uh, I mean, a potential that has support everywhere. Now, uh, before moving on, let me just make one comment that usually in a high energy particle physics, case A is the only thing there is. So in the real world, when you have an electron, an electron emits a photon, and then the other electron absorbs the photon. So that emission happens locally, ultra-locally. So the interaction is locally. Then uh, what sometimes we do is we forget about the photon and generate an effective interaction between the two electrons. And then it looks long range, it looks Coulomb, right? It's the Coulomb interaction. So the fundamental theory was local. Everything was happening locally. The electron locally emits the photon, the photon locally can create a pair of electron positron, etc. And at the end, everything is local. But if you integrate out some stuff, like you get you ignore the photons, then you get an effective theory for the electrons where you have Coulomb interactions and longer range forces. Right? So these ultra-local cases are not a curiosity from a high energy point of view. They would be the typical, the most fundamental type of interactions. But when you integrate stuff out, you get longer range. And what type of longer range do you get? If you integrate massless stuff, massless stuff propagates very far. And so it generates an effective interaction between the massive stuff, which is power law. That's like Coulomb, that's like gravity, right? So gravity and Coulomb are power law. If you integrate out massive particles, if you say I have a massive particle, but, it's, uh, but I, I integrate it out, and I just consider the effect on my other particles of, that, uh, of the exchanges of that massive particle, you get exponentially decaying potentials. And so this type of potential where I say it decays like an exponential, you could motivate it by saying it could be the type of potential that you get if there were another massive particle that you got rid of. And so the natural potentials, the natural long-range behavior of potentials, typically falls into these two possibilities. It's either exponential or power law. You could have more things, but typically, if you integrate massive stuff, it's exponential. You integrate out massless stuff, it's power law. So what do we say for power law? Nothing. In these lectures, we don't say anything about power law. Actually, I wrote a section in the notes about Coulomb, Coulomb scattering, but it's in the notes. I'm not going to discuss it in the lectures, but it's a little bit more complicated because when the potential decays only as a power law, it's a long-range potential. It's harder to separate the particles to scatter. They are never really, truly very well separated. They always feel like the other particle is there, and that leads to some extra complications that we don't want to deal with. OK, so that was the first comment. Uh, then, so we have Schrodinger equation. Now let me stress that if you have Schrodinger equation, that implies that at large x, the wave function has this solution, because at large x, I just ignore the potential. And this is exact sometimes in case a and b, provided I am uh, here in this region, there's no approximation. It's, not approxi it's just equal, because the potential is just 0. And this equation has these two solutions. It doesn't matter if k is real or complex. It's just a fact of life. This equation has two solutions. And so this defines, for me, S of k. So this equation is the definition of what we call the S matrix, which is the relative coefficient between the incoming and the outgoing wave. Why do we call it incoming and outgoing? Because of what we saw last time, that one matters in the past, one matters in the future. Of course, for case C, it's approximate. Then for case C, you need to go far away to make sure it's true. But that's but still it will be true far away. Now, from this equation, it follows that you can write the S matrix also in this way. And today we are going to take advantage of this other representation. And then we also saw that the S matrix has these nice properties. This one tells me that stuff in the upper half plane can be related to stuff in the lower half plane. 
And this one tells me that stuff in the right half plane can be, can be related to stuff in the left half plane. Okay. <clears throat> now, from this definition of this matrix, we see that if we go to a pole of this matrix where this term is diverges, and therefore 1 over s goes to 0, the, S the wave function becomes just this at the pole of the S matrix. And if the pole of the S matrix, if it's in the upper half plane, then this decays at large x. And so this will be OK. I would accept this wave function if I'm in the upper half plane. And that's the definition of a bound state. It's a wave function that decays uh, exponentially far away when particles become far away. Now, of course, the energy is k square. Which, the way we think about it, is that for physical energies, we can either be in the continuum when k square is positive, and then we scatter stuff asymptotically and receive it asymptotically, or at a few discrete values that are where the bound states are. And the bound states will be at the poles of the S matrix in the upper half plane. An example, a simplest example, was this potential where we compute the potential for the delta function, and indeed it had a pole, and indeed this pole was in the upper half plane when we expect it to be in the upper half plane when the potential is attractive, and therefore mu is negative. We also saw that this potential has no essential singularity, so at infinity it just goes to one in this case, but one is not important. What's important is that it doesn't matter how you go to infinity, you get the same thing. So, so yesterday, we were studying general properties of S matrix and a little bit of poles. Today, it's the opposite. Today, we will be mostly discussing poles and a little bit of general properties of S matrix. But today, it's really mostly about the singularities and what, is the, what we expect for the analytic behavior of S matrices, as far as singularities and particular poles go. OK. So uh, any question about uh, what we have seen so far? So let's, yeah. I have a question. Uh, in the example where it's possible to use the properties of the wave function in the interaction region, because we use uh, the wave functions in the region where is the, the Dirac, Dirac delta. So uh, the expression that we find is kind of in terms of the wave functions in the derivatives and it's yeah. it only a symptotic term. This? Yeah. So this expression is the same as it, it, it has the same caveats as this. So this equation is ex in case a and b. It, it, it naively you say this depends on x, right? Because x is here, x is here, x is here. But it doesn't. If you evaluate it at any point here, pom 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 pom, this is x independent and it's equal to a function of k only. That's the S matrix. Right? Uh, it doesn't matter the s values. No, it doesn't matter where x is, provided it's after the range of the potential. Now, in case C, you have to be more careful. In case C, you should take x to be large. So you should take this expression, put some limit when x goes to infinity, and evaluate it at large x. For case A and B, you can evaluate it this at any point to the, left of the, to the right of the potential. Any other question? OK, so then let's move to another example where we will have poles. So let's consider another potential to start learning more about these poles. And we consider the simplest example of type A. Let's consider the simplest example of type B. So let's consider another example where the potential V of x is just a well. Okay. Now, let me, uh, let's use, let's imagine we have some particle with some momentum k coming in. And so what would be the, the wave function? Let's just write the wave function. The wave function would be, if I am at the right, the wave function is e to the minus i k x plus the S matrix S of k e to the i k x. If I am, this is for x bigger than a. If x is smaller than a, it is just the same with x flipped to minus x. The function is even. 
And, and then we have the region inside the well, when x is between minus a and a, where, what should we write? Sorry? A wave. Normally it would be a sine and a cosine, but the function is even, so we just write a cosine. So we have another coefficient, let's call it a, the amplitude of the wave inside the box. It's a function of k. And then we have cosine of x with q, where q, of course, is such that q squared is equal to k squared plus v0. Right? Is it clear? Namely, let's see if we got the signs right. So I just wrote it quickly, but let's figure out if the signs are right. So we are saying that if v0 is positive, then uh, the velocity inside is bigger. It makes sense, because we scatter at some energy, right? Co this energy, the energy here becomes bigger compared to the bottom of the potential, right? So when uh, v0 is positive, indeed, the q is bigger than k, and the particle speeds up when it's inside the well. <laughs> It, it has a, with that energy, the particle can go faster. If V0 is negative, the particle slows down compared to K. And sometimes even becomes complex. Right? Q becomes complex if V0 is negative enough. That just means that you have a wall that is bigger than your energy. And then uh, to pass to the other side, you need to tunnel. Right? And so the wave function inside the wall is exponentially small. Right? So you have three possibilities. Attractive. And then when it's repulsive, it can be repulsive, but your energy is above the potential or it's below the potential. Right? And that makes sense in this. So it's what, precisely what we see here. And now it's trivial to find S because you just impose that at this point, Psi and Psi prime match. So you have two equations, psi at, uh, at that point is equal to psi at, uh, on the left and right, and uh, psi prime as well, right? Now there's no discontinuity like in the delta function, you just equate them, and you find, by equating, you find s and k. And let me write what s is. s of k for this potential is equal to e to the minus 2i k a times k minus i q. q is a function of k. It obeys that equation. It's some square root of k squared plus v0. Tangent of a q. And here, q plus i q. Tangent of a q. So this is our second S matrix. So let's maybe put it in a box. So this is our S matrix for the square well. <clears throat> Let's just do one check. Let's do it by head. There's no point in writing. Or, or let's do it quickly. So notice that there is a particular limit we could take where the well is very small and very deep. And I could tune it to become exactly the delta function we had before, right? It's enough to take a to 0, the potential very big, and the area in that rectangle to be 1, right? So how should we tune? We should send a to 0. We should say that v0, well, if this length is 2a, I want v0 to be 1 over 2a, so that the area now is 1 and to match it with the convention of the previous problem times minus mu. Right? And now I just take a to 0 and v0 to infinity with the, in this way. Correct? Now, because v0 goes to infinity, q is approximately equal to just v0. Right? So q is to square root of v0. And a times q is very small, right? So a times q is very small because this, is, this goes like 1 over square root of a, right? And so a times q is very small, so I can just expand this tangent and replace this by a q. And so I get a q square, but a q square is just a v0, and I multiply, and I get precisely mu over 2, 
with the minus sign, that cancels the minus sign, and poof, I get exactly that expression there. Okay? So it, it works exactly when we just expand this at small argument of the tangent, and I put a to zero, so I ignore this first term, and I go exactly to the delta function, okay? So this s goes indeed to the s of the delta function. Now, you can then analyze this, uh, these bound states. If you, it's easy to do some simple change of variables and to look where are these bound states, where are the poles of this S matrix. And the poles, after you call this variable inside the tangent Y, they become the solution to the equation square root of A square V0 minus Y square equal to Y tangent of Y. Okay? So all we did, all I did was I call AQY and uh, then uh, I, uh, that the pole, the, the, those factors become this. I'm doing it fast because I assume most people did this problem, but maybe not in this language of S matrix, but in the language of reflection and transmission, etc. And so, what do we have here? We have a function here, on, the, on this function here on the right. It starts at zero, and then it blows up at the, the, when tangent is pi over two, when the argument is pi over two. Then it comes, and it's zero when y is equal to pi, when the tangent is zero at pi. So this would be pi and then it blows up again, and then at 2 pi is 0 again, and then it blows up, and then it blows up, and then it blows up. On the other hand, this function here, if it starts at some finite value, and then y can go up to that value, so y can go up to that value, where this value is precisely related to this quantity here. Right? This value is square root of, uh, of that. Right? And so what we see is that there are a bunch of poles that depend on the size of this factor. So the deeper the potential is, the more poles I catch. And that makes sense, right? The deeper is the potential, the more bound states I have. Yeah. Right? This equation is just this, this equals zero. I just called a q y, and then this q is y times a, I multiply by a, and then a times k is this, if I just use the equation for q. Right? So it is just, um, don't forget that q and k are related in a simple way. Yes? Right. Don't we have infinite poles on the case of the delta? Well, what matters, you see, it's the deeper it is at fixed A, but what matters is really A squared times V0. So you can get more poles either by making it deeper or by making it bigger, uh, wider. What matters is really the area, this A squared times V0. This is really what matters. And in the delta function, this quantity uh, is going to zero. So then I only get this first one here. Right? Now, so this gives you immediately how many poles there are, how many bound states there are. And if we go back, you remember that Schrodinger came from a Schrodinger equation with all the h bars and m and so on. Now we can count very well how many bound states there are, right? It's just related, it's this divided by pi basically plus one, how many bound states I catch. And I can convert back to the previous case to see that there are, one plus the integer part of the square root of two m v zero a square over pi square h bar square. This bracket stands for the integer part, so if this is 2.3, it's two bound states.
okay, L let me, I want to count because there is a simple argument to see why should this be the number of bound states. Okay, so we just computed, we solved this equation, we found where are the poles, and what did we see? We, see the, we saw that the poles are, there are as many, there are bigger, more and more poles as the potential is bigger. We saw that there are these many poles. And this has a simple explanation. So you think that you have a, you have a potential well, right? And you ask, how many bound states does this potential support, right? So we have the first bound state, then we have the second bound state, etc. How many bound states there are? Okay. Notice that, uh, okay, uh, there is one more in between. But I'm drawing the even wave functions because this, this should be even. Uh, that's why I'm not drawing the odd one where it's zero at the origin. So how many states there are? So you can say that the energy, I can put bound states here until they start leaking out. Right? I put particles in the box, they can have more and more, more, at some point they leak out. Right? So the maximum K I can put is given by equating the kinetic energy, H square, K square, over 2M to V0. So this gives me K max, the maximum K. Right? So this tells me I can put states up to this K. So K max is square root of something. Right? And then, how may, what's the spacing in K between the states? That's easy. I just have these modes, this cosine with higher and minor modes, and the spacing is just pi over A in K space, right? Just the, the usual spacing uh, between the, the states, right? And therefore, it follows immediately this, that uh, for large, for a large potential, k is square root of this, I divide by the spacing, and I get precisely the asymptotic behavior of this formula. Okay? So this is just how to understand semi-classically. That is, for a big potential and many bound states, the picture is that I just have a well, I can put their states, they are spaced by pi over k, right? Because you have cosine, cosine of 2k, cosine of 3k, so the spacing is these multiples of uh, pi, uh, pi over a. And then I can put uh, these states there and um, uh, up to the maximum energy, otherwise they start leaking out of the potential. Now, good, so we find these poles. Uh, and let's make a few comments here. So, there is a property that we find, which is that the poles are at k equal to i kappa, where this guy is bigger. So they are in the imaginary axis, as we expect them to be. Also, I sometimes also call this k star. At the pole, one can check that this matrix behaves as I over K minus K star. And then the residue tells you how strongly you couple to that pole. Right? If you have 10 poles, and say the first two have a very big residue, the other ones have a very small residue, it means those bound states couple are very weakly coupled. And the, the bigger the residue is, the more the, you can think that these particles form the bound state much more likely. Okay? And this coupling here is positive. Uh, this, you can say, is the strength of the residue. You, it's an observation. You can compute the residue at those poles. It's one of the exercises. And you will find that this is positive at all the poles. You can also check that it was positive in our example, of course. When you go to k equal minus i mu, the residue is precisely minus i mu, so it's i times minus mu, but mu was negative, and so it's positive. Right? So it was positive here as well. So in all examples we find, the residues are positive. And the residues are in the imaginary axis. And so one thing we could ask is if this is a true property. So we, could, we, would, we would like to show that a possibility is all residues 
are positive and k star is in the imaginary axis. And indeed, that's what we are going to establish in a few seconds. It's an important result. That's very important to know that S matrices have poles, but not any poles. One, they need to be in the upper half plane. Two, they need to be moreover on the axis, not anywhere on the imaginary. And the residue needs to be positive. The residue needed to be positive is the trickiest one to show. That's a little bit non-trivial. It's a consequence of unitarity, but it's a subtle consequence of unitarity. And we are going to spend a few time, some time discussing it. The last thing I want to mention is that you see that there is this exponential here. And because of this exponential, this S matrix has a very different behavior when I go to I infinity compared to this. This S matrix, when I go to I infinity, was just going to one. There was nothing special going on there. Now, because of this exponential, when I go to I infinity, this factor blows up. And moreover, it depends how I approach infinity. Now, for this S matrix, suppose I am here in the K plane, and I start here and I go to infinity, or I start here and I go to infinity, or I, yeah. All these ways of approaching infinity, now they do give me a different behavior for this S matrix. Right? And so this is the definition of an essential singularity. So now what we see is that here there exists an essential singularity. And indeed, if you do the computation, you can see that here in this upper part, the S matrix is approximately equal to a constant divided by k squared times e to the minus 2i ka. And this exponential is exactly the essential singularity. And so the second statement we could have is that for a potential v of x of type b, Okay. This is the essential singularity. In other words, the S matrix, S of k, divided by this factor, I take out this factor, e to the minus 2i k a, has no essential singularity. Can you read here? And this would be another box that could be another general properties of S matrices. Perhaps this is true, perhaps not. And the claim is that these two boxes that I wrote there are indeed true. And uh, this one, I'm not going to show in detail. Maybe I'll show it, but I don't think I will have time. But it's a true statement that the essential singularity of this potential, and we'll see more examples where this, you will see it's not a coincidence of this potential. So potentials of type B have an essential singularity. Notice that when A goes to zero, it disappears. So when it becomes local, then it disappears. But this object S divided by this factor, now we remove the essential singularity. Now if you divide by this factor, just one over K squared. One over K squared is the same, doesn't matter how you approach infinity. You see, it's not one anymore. One was not important. What's important is that it doesn't matter how you approach. So one over K squared has no essential singularity at infinity. It just goes to zero, doesn't matter how. Right? And so, we have these two boxes the, that uh, we are going to study. Residues exist. They are in the upper half plane in the imaginary axis with positive residue. And potentials of type B have essential singularities. So it's not uh, they are there, these essential singularities, but they are universal, and we can just divide them out. OK. So, so indeed, let's, uh, let's start by uh, the beginning and show the first property. Let me see what do I need. Um, yeah, this we don't need. So, so let's show that poles 
First, let's show that poles are in the imaginary axis, and then let's show that the residues of poles is positive. Okay. Okay. So if you have Schrodinger equation, right? so this is a Schrodinger equation, one thing you can do is you can take Schrodinger equation, which is Hamiltonian acting on psi equal to 0. You can write the Schrodinger equation for the conjugate uh, wave function, and then you would conjugate the Hamiltonian. What does conjugating this Hamiltonian mean? I just mean that inside we have k star instead of k. When I conjugate this operator, the potential is real, and k, I put k star, and that's it. Right? So I just conjugate the equation. And then uh, we can multiply this equation by the psi star and multiply this equation by psi. And of course, this continues to be true. And then we can subtract both equations. And when we subtract both, you see that the potential drops because I get a psi bar v psi and the other equation psi v psi bar. The potential is real, so it drops. And what we get by subtracting both equations is the following. We get, so we subtract both. And this leads to the following equation. Let me write it and, it, and then I'll explain why this is the equation we get. We get psi prime times psi bar minus psi bar prime times psi plus k square minus k star square. So this was, as I said, one equation at k star, and I subtracted it. I got the difference. Times psi psi bar, which is absolute value of psi square, and we integrate from minus infinity to x. So you see that what we get, what, if we subtract both, what we get is actually the derivative of this equation. If I take the derivative, I get absolute value square. And if I take the derivative of this equation, if the derivative acts here, I get psi prime prime, psi prime prime. If the derivative acts on the other one, they cancel. Right? You see? So I just integrated the equation. I got an equation, and I just integrated it. Is it OK? OK, so this is an equation. And now, using this equation, this is an important equation. So we'll take this equation. And we will go and see, look at this factor here, the pole of the S matrix. We will look at this factor, and we will study this factor here. Right? And what we want to see is look for the absolute value of square of this factor, to see where can it be 0, so that we see where are the poles of this object. OK? So the idea is now, let's compute the absolute value of that factor there. So psi prime minus i k psi. Let's compute the square of this absolute value. And the square of this absolute value obeys the following equation. Let me write it and then tell you how you would check. It's trivial. And the following equation is an important one. It's psi prime plus the imaginary part of k times psi square. That's one term. plus the absolute value of the real part of k times psi square. That's another term. Plus, now let me continue here, plus 4 times the real part of k square imaginary part of k without square oh. 
times the integral from minus infinity to x of the absolute value of psi square dy. So this equation, all you have to do to check this equation is compute explicitly this absolute value, compute explicitly this one, compute explicitly this one, right? Just open it up. And you will see that the difference between these two terms and this one is precisely these two terms here, that then we can massage and uh, use this equation to write it. Ah, I forgot a zero, right? So, yeah, I forgot that important <laughs> equal to zero. I subtract, I get an equation, I don't get some, right? So using then this equation, I get this, and you see that here k minus k star times k plus k star is just real part times imaginary part. So that's why it became what I wrote there. Okay, so it's just algebra. I just take this uh, equation that we understood where it came from. It just makes this into a true statement. Okay, so this is just algebra, right? Uh, is there any question here? It's clear, right? You just open up the parentheses and you check if it's true. But now, uh, let's look and let's try to make this zero. And you see that if this needs to be zero, right? so we want to look We want to look for zeros of this quantity for in the upper half plane, where imaginary part of k is positive. Right? This means upper half plane, right? Because the poles are in the upper half plane. Now, if the poles are in the upper half plane, let's see. So this factor here is, is an absolute value square. This one is an absolute value square. So these first two factors are bigger or equal than zero, right? So these first two factors here are bigger or equal than zero. They are absolute value squares. And so if I want this to be zero, this term needs to be zero, right? Because each one is bigger or equal than zero, so they all need to be zero separately. And the imaginary part is positive. So the imaginary part is positive, so this term cannot cancel the other two. Because since the imaginary part is positive, and since this is positive, this stuff here, imaginary part times the integral, is also positive. Right? So how could, I get, how, could, how could I get a zero? Can I get a zero if the real part is uh, not zero? No. Right? So the only way I can get a zero is if the real part of k is zero. Right? And so we see that we need real part of k equal to zero. Right? And so poles are in the imaginary axis. That's what we wanted to show. So the statement is, I am adding positive plus positive plus real part squared times positive. How could this thing be zero? Right? Positive plus positive plus real part squared times positive. The only thing that can be zero is the first is zero, the second is zero, and the real part is zero. This is needed. We need it. It doesn't mean I, I, I'm not saying it's sufficient. It's not, right? We don't have poles at all real case, right? We have poles at specific real case. But uh, we cannot have poles if real part of k is not zero. That's what we wanted to show. If the poles are there, they are at real part of k equals zero, and we did it, right? So we need real part of k to be equal to zero. Now notice that if it was in the lower half plane. No, we could have poles at other locations in the lower half plane. Because in the lower half plane, this imaginary part has an opposite sign. It can cancel the other two. It's not a problem. Right? And so the picture we have is that in the lower half plane, we can have poles. And so the mathematical picture we are arriving is the following. So if we think of K, we have the following picture. 
we have poles in the upper half plane that can correspond to bound states. Right? Now, these poles, if I were to look at the lower half plane, because of this equation, these poles become zeros in the lower half plane, right? You see, a pole in the upper half plane is a zero in the lower half plane, right? Because for one to explode, minus needs to, when it's minus. So there are some zeros in the lower half plane. Let's use both to denote zeros. That's the image of what's happening upstairs, right? If I have a pole in the upper half plane, I have a zero at minus k. But in the lower half plane, we could have poles. That's OK. And they don't need to be in the real axis. They could be like this. OK? And these poles that could be in the lower half plane, they are there, typically. And we'll see examples where they are there tomorrow. And what would they do in the upper half plane? How would they show up? Zero. As zeros. So then there would be these zeros here in the upper half plane. So in the upper half plane, the poles are in the imaginary axis. And the zeros, and there could be some zeros in some other locations. They could also be in the imaginary axis. It's not a problem. Uh, and uh, we interpreted these guys as bound states. And tomorrow, we will see that these zeros, they are also interesting and physical, and they are what are called resonances. But I don't think we'll get them there today. But that's the picture we are getting. We have poles in the upper half plane, in the imaginary axis. In the lower half plane, no, we could have in other locations. We could say, oh, maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it's still in the imaginary axis. No, it's not. There are typically poles in the lower half plane in other locations. And depending on where they are, they often can be interpreted as resonances, as we are going to explain. So this is the picture. And what about infinity? At infinity, we are also starting to get a picture where here, at infinity, there is no essential singularity for the case A. And there is an essential singularity for case B. But we know what it is. OK, so this was about uh, establishing that the zeros are in the imaginary axis. Next, we would like to establish that they are positive, that these poles are not only in the imaginary axis, but they are positive. This one is a little bit more subtle, but that's what we are going to do next. OK, uh, so that's what we do now. Any question here? So let's show that this pole, the residue of these poles needs to be positive. The idea is to take Schrodinger equation. So we'll take Schrodinger equation and derive Schrodinger equation with respect to k. They are positive for the upper uh, half plane poles. Yeah. So the, the, the statement is bound state poles have positive residue. <clears throat> OK. So let me write an equation. It's one of the problems to show this equation, but I, I can give some hints. The hints are also in the problem set, but. Uh, uh, let me write it, and you can tell me if you think it merits going into details or whether you can accept it. And so the statement is that Schrodinger equation, or more precisely, if I take derivative with respect to k of Schrodinger equation, allows me to derive the following equation, which is that minus psi d to psi, this equation is valid in general for any x, dx dk. So I take two derivatives, one with respect to x, one with respect to k, plus derivative of psi with respect to x, derivative of psi with respect to k, is equal to 2k 
integral, now not from minus infinity to x, but from 0 to x of psi of y square dy. OK, so, so this is an equation. So let me give you a few ideas on how to derive it. So you see that if you take derivative with respect to k of Schrodinger equation, you would, uh, you would take derivative of Schrodinger equation with respect to k. So the derivative connect here, or the derivative connect on the 2k, right? When the derivatives act on the, two, on the k square, it gives 2k. And then the derivative can also act, uh, act here. And then there is, the, there is the potential term here. Right? Following so far? Now multiply this equation, what you get, by psi. Right? Just multiply by psi. Then one term now becomes psi times the potential. OK? Now use Schrodinger equation to replace psi times the potential by the other two terms. And massage a bit, and you get that. OK? So just algebra. So is it OK? And you get the derivative of that. And then you integrate to get to this particular equation. Is it OK? Do I need to do details, or can we continue from here? So this is just a true equation that, uh, let me just make uh, one comment, that uh, here we chose the integration to go from minus infinity to x. And the reason for doing so is that we could argue that at minus infinity, this term was 0. This was uh, used in one of the exercises. And so when you integrate, it's good that in one of the endpoints you control what the function is. Here, it turns out that you want to integrate from 0 because you want to use that this vanishes at x equal to 0. And indeed, it does just because the function is even. And so derivative with respect to x is 0 at 0. And here, derivative with respect to x is 0, even if you take derivative with respect to k. Right? So that's why this 0 appears instead of infinity. It's because this is 0 by the function being even. OK, so we derive this equation. This is exact. It's valid for any x. And now let's apply this equation in the region for potentials a and b in the region where we can replace the wave function by this. This is exact if I am at x bigger than a. So for any x bigger than a, I can plug and get this, right? And so this expression, the right and this stuff here, becomes equal. The left-hand side of this is equal. I'm just plugging the wave function there. And this expression, when I plug that asymptotic, becomes the following, becomes minus i e to the 2i kx plus i e to the minus 2i kx divided by s plus 4kx divided by s minus, and the most important term is this one, 2i k times s prime divided by s squared. This is just plugging that wave function in this expression. OK? I like this wave function here with this normalization because it's normalized. So when I go to the pole, I get 1 times exponential that decays. So it's a real wave function. It just behaves very nicely with coefficient 1 times the decaying exponential. Right? And with this choice of normalization, that left hand side becomes that. OK? And now let's go here and let's zoom in close to the pole. Let's now go approach, make k approach the pole. So when k approaches a pole, notice that this goes to 0 if I approach a pole, and this goes to 0 if I approach a pole. What about this one? Does this go to 0, to infinity? What happens? If I, go to a, if I have a pole. Let's think of a pole, 1 over x. Right? What's the derivative? 
1 over x squared. What is 1 over x squared is 1 over x squared. So it, it just goes to a constant. So this is constant, close to a pole. This goes to 0, this goes to 0. So I, if I go close to the pole, I drop these two terms. After going close to the pole, let's go to x large. If I go to x large, I can drop this one as well. Because remember that the one with plus sign is exponentially small. OK? So if I go to x large, if I go first to the pole and then to x large, I can drop the first, the second, and the third term, and I only get this last one. And so we derive the nice equation, which is that 1 over s squared times derivative of the S matrix with respect to K is equal to I times the integral from 0 to infinity of psi of y squared dy, where psi was normalized to be a real function that decays with coefficient 1 times exponential at infinity. OK? And that's it. This quantity is, of course, equal to i times a positive number. And this quantity, if I uh, zoom in close to a pole, this number is nothing but 1 over the residue of the pole with a minus sign. And so I conclude that the residue is i divided by this positive number. Okay? And so we show that the residues of the S matrix are positive. Okay? So I got this equation by going first k close to the pole, and then I took x large. That's why it's, my, it's infinity here. And so, we continue, let me just uh, write something here, that we continue learning things, and we learn that these guys have i times uh, positive uh, residue. Yeah? The bound states decay exponentially, so it's some wave function. What would be the correct wave function? It would be something, if I have, say, I mean, it can be something that decays exponential, then it does whatever it wants to do, and then it decays exponential. Right? So it doesn't matter what exactly it is. What we are saying is that the integral here, this area here, this integral square, right, the square of this function, this integral, from 0 to infinity of psi squared is positive. We chose the normalization of psi to be a real function with 1 times exponential at infinity. Right? So it's just positive, it's just a square. And therefore, the residue is positive. The wave function forms a bound state. It doesn't need, I need to study the wave function where the wave function is most interesting. I study it at infinity because it's easier. I know there's a bound state if things are decaying. If things are decaying, it's because they are stuck where they are not there. So this equation is true, always true, for any x, provided the wave function is even. And I took advantage of this equation. I simplified the left-hand side. To get the left-hand side to this, I already am outside the interaction region. And then I want to simplify it even more. And what do I do? I go close to the pole. Then I kill these two terms. And then I go to large x to kill the first turn, and I could get only the derivative. Okay. Good. And so we learn what's in the boxes, that potentials of type. Uh, so you see that there are some exponentials here. So there, would be, there is a way of taking this equation, continuing further a little bit more, and using this, the fact that these exponentials are appearing here and that this equation is valid up to entering the box to prove this box here with the essential singularity. It is just a bit tricky to do, I'm not going to do. But it would, this would be the starting point to massage a little bit more and to prove this equation here. You see the exponentials are already here, divided by s and so on. It, it would, it's not going to be so hard, but it will take like 20 minutes. Yeah.
Yeah, it's similar, right? So derivative of log of s is s prime over s. So I can multiply the equation by s and get that an equation for the phase shift in terms of s. It's true. It will be a way of computing the phase shift, but you need to know s anyway because the other terms would have s. So it doesn't help you that much. Now, people that are very mathematical, they like this equation a lot to say this equation shows that the derivative of s with respect to k exists. So if you are super mathematical, this equation shows the derivative exists and is well defined. And because the derivative exists and is well defined, the function is holomorphic. Uh, okay. I see, uh, for us, it's obvious it's holomorphic. And k appears as a parameter. Of course, it's holomorphic. <laughs> if you are really picky, you use this equation to, to, to look smart. OK. Uh, good. So, so that's it. So we are starting to learn a lot about S matrices, and we have this beautiful picture, and it's such a singularity sometimes, but easy to remove. Um, notice that if you, if you consider the complex plane for the function where you divide by this exponential, that this division by the exponential doesn't change anything about those properties, because this exponential evaluated in the imaginary axis is positive. Right? It's exponential of a real number. And so it doesn't change the fact that the bound states are positive, etc. So if you want to consider always this S matrix divided by the essential singularity, then the analytic properties would have no essential singularities and be exactly what's described here, which is nice. But this was for case A and B. And now let's find the simplest example for case C. And that's what we are going to do in the last part of the lecture is to consider the last example. And that's the last thing we're going to learn about poles. We learned beautiful things, and now we are going to learn some not so beautiful things. We are going to learn that bound states are poles, but poles don't need to be bound states. And that's sad, but it's true. And we are going to see why. And so let's consider the simplest potential of type C. So that's the last example for today, I think. So it's when V is just e to the minus x over e. And uh, just let's put some normalization. If I put some mu and 1 over 2a, This is a potential. So I, I, I wrote it like this, because written like this, when a goes to 0, you can easily see that this is a, this another representation of the delta function. So a going to 0 now just sends this potential to a delta function. So as I change a, I get potentials that are more and more looking like a delta function as a goes to 0. a goes to 0, the potential goes to mu times delta of x. So at least we know that with this normalization, when a goes to 0, we must recover the S matrix we got before. OK. So you plug this potential into Schrodinger equation, and you have a differential equation, second order. So it has two solutions. And they are known, and they are Bessel functions. Okay? So let me just write what. So there are two solutions of this differential equation. We are solving it exactly, not asymptotically. We just plug, again, this potential here, solve this differential equation. There are two solutions. They are modified Bessel functions. And so our wave function is a linear combination of these two Bessel functions, f of x and g of x, where f of x is this Bessel function i with index minus 2i, k. So that's the index of the Bessel function. I'm going to tell you what the definition of the Bessel function is in a second. And the argument is square root of 2a mu e to the minus x over 2a. And g uh, is the same with the, the opposite sign here. Okay. So g of x is equal to i with plus, and then the same. OK? And now this Bessel function, it's a, 
it, you can define it through its Taylor expansion. So it's And this Bessel function, I knew for any argument x, or z, let me use z because x is used already here, for any argument z is defined as a sum from m equals 0 to infinity, 1 over m factorial, gamma function of m plus nu plus 1, and then z over 2, that's the Taylor expansion to the power 2m plus nu. Okay. <clears throat> and notice, of course, that this is approximately equal to the first term if z is very small, which for us corresponds to x being very large. So it's great because x large is where we do the experiment. So at large x, we just keep the first term of each Bessel function, and that's it. Do you agree? OK. So let's keep this beautiful complex plane, and let's erase everything else. So now, what would be the wave function? The wave function is a linear combination of these two functions. What should it be? What should I write for the linear combination? How can I fix the linear combination? Integrating what, where, how? So what should this, fun what should this wave function satisfy, which is very important? So you go to zero at infinity. That's not true because it's a scattering state. So it's a, it should be a, plane, a, com, a linear combination of an incoming and an outgoing plane wave. And it should be It should be even. And so the derivative at zero should be zero. And so it's very easy to see that the correct wave function, therefore, must be, if I take derivative and I plug zero, it must be zero. So the first term must be g prime of zero times f of x minus f prime of 0 times g of x. Right? That makes sure that the derivative at 0 is 0. Right? So up to an overall constant, it, this is the solution. Right? Do you agree? This just follows from imposing that the function is even, and therefore psi prime of 0 is equal to 0. OK, and now we can take this. Right? And, then, and analyze it at large x by doing what? By taking the first term in the exponentials. The first term, m is 0. Nu is this. Right? So you see what you get. You get this exponential raised to this power. The 2a cancels the 2a, and I get exactly i k x. And in the other one, minus i k x. So I get exactly the two plane waves. Right? And therefore, by comparing the relative coefficient of the two plane waves, I get the S matrix. Right? So I can write the S matrix right away. Right? And from this, I compute the S matrix. And so let me write what S matrix we get. I can write it here below so that we have our two S matrices, one below the other. And uh, we can do it by head together, but I'll just write it and you'll see that you agree. S of K is the ratio of the two S matrices. So there are this G prime of zero over F prime of zero, where G and F are these Bessel functions. That's clear. It's the ratio of those two terms. Then, uh, because Z has some factors of square roots and there's these two, etc. There is some factor which is e to the minus 2ika log of a mu over 2. Right? That's just because it's not just e to the x, but there is some square roots, etc. And finally, 
because we take the m equal to zero term, but there are this gamma function here, there is times a ratio of gamma functions, gamma of 1 minus 2 i k divided by gamma of 1 plus 2 i a k. Okay? And now we see that this S matrix, it has this Bessel function part. Let's call it the Bessel part. And it has the gamma function part. And this gamma function part has poles. Do you know that the gamma function has poles for negative integers? Right? The gamma function has positive integers. It's the factorial. And that negative integers, it has poles. Right? And so we should look at this gamma function up here and ask when is the argument of this gamma function equal to a negative integer? Right? And so this gamma function here will produce poles. This guy here will produce poles at 1 minus 2 i a k equal to minus n, where n is 0, etc. 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Starting at 0. And therefore, these are poles at k equal, this goes here, this goes here, 1 plus n over 2a. Oh, no. It should be times i. Uh, but it's over i right now. Uh, Ah, because I got uh, some uh, wrong signs here, okay. Plus, minus, plus, and then it's okay. And you see, these poles are in the upper half plane, right? Do you agree? These poles are in the upper half plane, and they are in the imaginary axis. Right? And so these poles here, they would give you some energy. If I were to trust these poles and compute the binding energy, these poles would give some binding energy, which would be something like minus. Okay, if I put all the factors, h bar square, n plus 1 square over m square a square. It would be a tower, an infinite tower of, of bound states. Right? And these are fake. All these bound states are fake. They are not. You cannot have this infinite tower, right? When, when A goes to zero, you get a single one. You don't get blah, 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 blah. Right? Uh, we don't want to get all these infinite towers. So these are fake. Fake news. There, there's no such tower of blah, 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 unbounded tower of poles. So they, are they poles of this matrix? Yes. There is a gamma function. These poles are there. They are poles of the gamma function. But we claim they don't correspond to, to bound states. So how could this be? So what goes wrong? So we have this beautiful picture. But now this picture has to be modified. It seems like there are some poles we don't like. Some poles are bound states, but some we don't like. So let's think a little bit more and realize that you see that we said that the first term matters if z is very small, right? What's the correction to that? It's the m equal to one term, right? And then the correction to that is the m equals to two term, etc. So let's look more carefully at the asymptotics of the wave function and write what's the, schema, what's the form of the expansion. So this wave function behaves as follows. It behaves as e to the minus i k x, and then there is e to the plus i k x with the S matrix, S of k. But dressing these terms, there are a set of corrections. 1 plus e to the minus, remember the argument was e to the minus x over 2a, so e to the minus x over 2a 
plus e to the minus x over a, or over 2a times 2, plus, with some number, plus, etc. And same thing here. 1 plus e to the minus x over 2a times some number, plus, etc. Right? That's the form of the expansion. Now, if k is real and x is big, it's all good. These terms are exponentially small and we just ignore them. Right? But now we are going to the, but this is the correct form of the wave function. And now we are going to, to take k and go up in the imaginary axis. Right? And as we go up, this term here now, as we go up, is becoming bigger. Right? This term is becoming a bit big. And this term is becoming a bit small, but that's fine. So this term becomes small, but this is even smaller because it's one, but this is small, right? But what we need to make sure, we need to, comp we need to make sure that this term here needs to be much bigger, for this approximation to be true, to the second term times this correction, right? So I, I want to trust only these two terms. I want to be able to drop these other ones. So I need this first term to be much bigger than e to the minus i k x minus x over 2a. Right? And when is this condition true? This is OK. This is true. And then I can trust everything we have been doing. If the imaginary part of k, you see, if the imaginary part of k, I put here, I get 2, I divide. Ah, no, sorry, remember, it was powers 2m. Remember, the powers were 2m, so there's no 2 here. Right? The powers were 2m, so there are no 2, there's no 2, there's no 2. Okay? So the imaginary part of k, I compare this and this, I get a factor of 2. Here there is no 2. And so this is true if imaginary part of k is smaller than 1 over 2a. Right? So the point is that if the imaginary part of k is smaller than 1 over 2a, then indeed I'm good. Then indeed the only terms that matter are this and this. This is the biggest one, fine. This is the next one, but then everyone else is subleading. As soon as k reaches 1 over 2a, which, mind you, is huge because a is small, typically, right? So a is the range, it's small, but it's, it's big, but it's there. Now I can no longer argue that I can drop this compared to this. Right? And because of that, things break down. It is just no longer, the, the analysis I did fails at that, uh, after that line. And so we conclude that this picture is true up to a line here. If we are in case C, there is this dangerous region here when the imaginary part of K is 1 over 2A. This is for case C. And here, in case C, we say there are dragons. I mean, it, it's hell breaks loose. And it's just whatever you can, you can get whatever you want. I mean, up here, it's hard to argue. Right? Up there, you, you lose control. You can no longer argue things. <laughs> but these poles, you see, they are, that's exactly where they start. Right? It's exactly at 1 over 2a. So they are exactly a tower of poles in this region. And so the claim is that here, there can be bound state poles and there can be fake poles as well that don't have the interpretation of bound states. And uh, a lot of the things we said uh, would break down at that precise uh, line. Okay? So again, to summarize, for case A and B, everything was rigorous. It was, uh, everything was equal signs. The wave function was exactly equal to that after the interaction region. There was no approximation. Everything we said was sharp. For case C, it looked very good, but it's exponentially decaying. It looked, if you are large enough, who cares? It's good enough. But not so much, because even though it's exponentially decaying, the oscillating exponentials can become big as you move to the complex plane. And then I, there could be some problem with the locality. And at some point, you don't know exactly what happens at very, very large energy. So if you have a potential that is not, uh, which doesn't have finite support, but has infinite support, 
Now you have this strip, huge strip where you trust things, but then you have some region of ignorance which is harder to argue for things. And in this region, you could have poles, the residue of the poles could be negative, the poles don't even need to be in the imaginary line, et cetera, and so, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so exploring the space of S matrices, now we start to, to see what we are dealing with. Ultra-local stuff, it's functions with a bunch of poles and zeros and no essential singularity, it's easy. Finite range, it's also easy because there is an essential singularity but you can divide it out. Finite range, but uh, finite, infinite support potential, the difficulty increases uh, infinitely. It becomes much, much harder to explore the space of such functions. And indeed, we'll say very little about those cases, but we'll say some things. And so, uh, that this is, uh, we are exactly at, at 30, so I think this is a good point to open for questions. That's right. So if I am below this line, then I do have the right to drop all these terms. Then everything we said follows, and therefore they should still be honest bound states. And indeed, this factor here, this Bessel factor, if you take A to 0, what happens? This goes to 0. This also goes to 0, because, to 1, basically, because it's A goes to 0. And this factor here is what becomes that delta function factor, which had a pole which is the pole, the physical pole of the delta function bound state. So this guy, it has bound states, a few. When A is small, it has one. When A is, is bigger, it has a few bound state poles. And these poles are honest, and they are here. And then we have the gamma functions that have these stupid poles up here. And this was a simple enough case that we could solve analytically and understand everything. In general, if the potential is a sum of exponentials or something like this, we can't. But we argue that this is still the physical picture. The, this X matrix is valid only if we accept that first approximation. If we are above this threshold, then we should have another S matrix that corresponds to considering the corresponding terms that are more important in the... It depends what your definition is. This is the definition of the S matrix. It's the function defined for uh, when I take uh, this uh, X large and K inside the strip. And then I analytically continue and I get some function, right? So this function, if k is real or if k is in the strip, is good. And this function is analytic, right? It's a function of k. Yeah, yeah. And it's true in this strip. Yeah, so we, you can either, you can, so if you trust this wave function, you just say the wave function, uh, if, if you trust this S matrix, then this is an analytic function. You just study it, whatever you want in the complex plane. Yeah, that, that's fair, but it corresponds to your problem we derived it using only the two first uh, terms of the expansion. So if another term becomes more important, shouldn't we derive another uh, as matrix using the more re relevant terms? In, in so... Because you said that above, uh, when image of k is greater than minus 1 over 2 way, then the other term becomes more relevant. Yeah. So. The, the, I think the honest answer is, when k is real or nearby real, this matrix has a sharp physical meaning. This matrix is the scattering amplitude when the moment is real. When the moment is complex, if we are lucky, it, we capture the bound states. If we go into this dangerous region, it's better not to use this matrix. Then what should you use? You should use what you do in, uh, when you learn in high school how to solve Schrodinger equation. You should look for wave functions that decay at infinity and you should go and solve Schrodinger equation from the get-go. That's how you would find bound states in the traditional way. You don't solve a scattering problem and then look for the poles. No, you just look for wave functions that decay and ask how many normalizable wave functions that decay at infinity are there. And you would study them and find all of them. Dangerous or not, you would just find them. You would. So, so yes, if you want to make sure I find all the bound states, what do I do? I discretize Schrodinger equation, I put it in a computer with decaying wave function and I find how many states there are. Right? And if you do it for this potential, you would find that depending on A, there could be five bound states. And, uh, and maybe all of them are below this line, or maybe some of them could sometimes be unlucky and they could be above the line.
in this region, you can have poles that are uh, not uh, purely uh, imaginary, yeah. Because they are not bound states, no. Yes, because the energy would be like complex to k squared. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the one, the imaginary ones, some could be bound states. The ones off the imaginary, bound, they for sure are not bound states. They for sure are spurious. But uh, that theorem that uh, all bound states uh, are at poles, uh, it's all always true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is always true. So you see that why would we care about this region? If we do physics, the lab is here. <laughs> why would we care about the region here? Right? And the answer is because if I want to study this function, I gain a lot of power if I explore the complex plane. If you tell me I have a function that in the complex plane has these three singularities plus this asymptotic behavior, typically that fixes the function uniquely. And then after I fix the function uniquely, I go to the, to the values of the lab, which is real k. But exploring the complex plane gives me really a lot of mileage. Right? Without the complex plane, uh, you can have any function you want, right? I mean, but with the complex plane, functions are really constrained. So this dragon, it's a pity because, OK, now we have to stay inside a strip. I cannot explore the full plane. And if you just tell me you have a function that has some singularity inside a strip, but outside the strip, I don't know, OK, then there could be many poles there. It's much harder to constrain the space of possible functions if you have this ignorance in this strip. So we'll still be able to say things. You will see in the last lecture. But until the last lecture, right now, we'll assume there is no such strip. So we'll assume the potentials are local or ultra-local. Um. Uh, so, uh, above the dragon region there, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have bound states. But on the opposite side, uh, opposite. below the uh, So here line. we have poles yeah. that when we see them, we know they are bound states. Above this line, we could have some poles could still be bound states. But we would never trust things in this line. In this line, above this line, uh, I would rather just... If the binding energy is bigger than 1 over 2a square, right? If I have a such big binding energies, I would just discretize Schrodinger equation and solve it numerically and see where the bound states are. Uh, but uh, on the, if we take the negative of the case on, on the dragon side. Sorry. You mean here or uh, here? Yeah. Uh, no, no, things the, here the, are just related by symmetry, so. The negative, the imaginary part. Here? Yeah. Ah, in the lower half plane. Yeah, we always stay typically in the upper half plane because things just repeated, right? So, so here there is another dangerous region at very negative values. But, uh, but if the, we have poles, but they're not bound states there, would, be, would they be bound states or something like that? Or? No, there's no new information by going to the lower half plane. Things are just uh, uh, repeated. When you have a pole, you have a zero. You just take S, you do one over S, and you get the lower half plane. So you don't gain anything by going to the lower half plane. There's no more information there. So we are almost at the point where we could start analyzing the analytic properties of these functions. What is still missing that I still want to introduce is this notion of these extra zeros that are resonances. So this is the last beast of physics. And then, uh, once we know, now we can ask physical questions, like what is the space of theories that have two bound states and one resonance? Right? And, uh, and now we can start asking these mathematical questions, because we know what analytic objects we are dealing with, and uh, we can start the second part of the title, which was the bootstrap part. So we need to introduce resonances, and then we can start exploring the space of theories that, uh, instead of doing example by example, as we have been doing now, we can ask these questions, what are the possible theories that have two bound states and one resonance, for example? Yeah. Uh, does the essential symbolize that this thing plays some role in physics, or is that a mathematical answer? No, 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 it plays some role. I mean, this S matrix is very much this phase, a phase shift like this, you would measure it very much, right? So this would give you a physical time delay. 
right? So uh, even for real k, right? For real k, this would say that the time delay is 2a, the space delay, right? So you would measure it uh, physically. It's like you have some finite range, and the particle arrives earlier because it doesn't travel in that finite range, for example and things like this. So this type of exponentials, you do measure it physically very much. And so measuring some constant time delay is an indication there is an essential singularity at infinity, if you measure some kind of fixed time delay. So, so it's very much physical, this essential singularity. Uh, one last question, I think. Does the S matrix give us some intuition about the physics of the process, or is it just a mathematical tool that we use to help us predict the scatter? I mean, the information has a ton of information. So, for example, if you plot, if you look at, the, if I give you this S matrix, and you see this is an S matrix that has a given number of bound states that increases or decreases with a parameter. That kind of tells you that you have a, a well that is becoming deeper or it's not so deep, right? Then you could compute a time delay for this object and ask, do particles arrive faster or slower depending on how I change my potential, right? That is, as I tune these parameters in this potential. And I will see that it depends if, if you have a big step where particle moves faster there, then it speeds up. But if the step is big, even if you travel faster, you prefer not to trip. So, right? so if you put a small step to help you and you are running, I mean, you, you trip and it's, you prefer that people don't help you, right? But if it's a big part where you run faster, so, so just by looking at the time delay and you see that sometimes it's a little bit, if it's big, then it's much faster. If it's small, actually, you, instead of helping, it, you don't help. But it depends on k, because if k is big, then you don't see the step. But if k is small, you can fall inside. So of course, just by looking at the phase shifts and analyzing phase shifts, you learn a lot about physics. And that's how people do particle physics. <laughs> you look at phase shifts, and, uh, and you try to learn what the theory, what the theory is. So, so it's not just uh, that it might give you some extra intuition. It is the way to get intuition, normally. Uh, it's possible to use the S matrix on the uh, Coulomb potential because if the case is lower than the exponential. But I've seen some tricks to to deal with the scattering. And it's possible in this case. So in the Coulomb potential, I don't want to, to go through in detail, but uh, it, it's the first, it would be the, it, it's what I had planned to start the lecture with, but I knew I was not going to have time, so I skipped it. But you can solve Schrodinger equation. Uh, okay, maybe let me just write one equation. It's, it's one minute. So if I solve Schrodinger equation for the Coulomb potential in three dimensions, let me tell you what the solution is. So you just take Schrodinger equation in the corner, but in three dimensions, and with the Coulomb potential. Then you solve it. You solve the scattering part with this Coulomb potential. And you find that the wave function now depends on three dimensions. So it depends on a three vector. It's equal to exponential of i k r, like a plane wave, and then uh, some uh, gamma function of 1 plus i gamma e to the minus pi gamma over 2, and then some hypergeometric function, some confluent hypergeometric function. It's just a special function. You can Google it to, to find uh, its definition. It has a Taylor expansion similar to the Bessel function. And then here, kr minus k dot r. So this notation is like in um, Ricardo's course. kr is absolute value of k 
absolute value of r, and k dot r is the dot product of the two vectors. Okay? So one is absolute distance, the other the orientation matters. And this wave function, if you go to very large x, behaves like this. It behaves as e to the minus i k dot r. So this looks like an incoming wave, but there is some extra i gamma log of this stuff. Let's call this dot, dot, dot. And then uh, there is plus. Let's call it S, like the S matrix. And then there is another term, divide by R, e to the I, K, R. Now without vector com compared to this and with a different sign, minus I, gamma, and the log. And this S of K is just equal to minus gamma over K, gamma function of 1 plus I gamma, gamma function 1 minus I gamma. This gamma is just the strength of the Coulomb interaction times 1 over 1 minus cosine of the scattering angle theta. Okay? Theta is the, the vector between K and R, like in uh, Ricardo's course. Okay, and now if you look at this wave function, you see that there are a couple of differences compared to what we did. So first of all, it's in three dimensions. Second, you see you have an incoming wave. You have an outgoing wave. And what do we see? We see that the outgoing wave has the extra 1 over r. Does it make sense? Yes, because I scatter the wave. There is a plane wave. It hits the target, and then it goes in all directions. Right? So to conserve probability, I need a 1 over r, because when I integrate the wave function squared times r squared, I better get conservation of probability. So this 1 over r compared to the incoming wave is the fact that things come, and then they go in all directions. OK, that's easy. But then uh, there's also a log. And this log uh, means that things, this is this effect of the long range. It's the fact that things really don't separate completely. So it's never true that I can just go and ignore the potential. If I ignore the potential, I would get this or this as solutions. But no, the log is still there. So it's never totally cool to drop the potential. I need this extra log stuff. Then, because we are doing two dimensions, things are not just functions of k. There's also some angular stuff. Let's ignore it for now. And then we have this gamma function. Right? And now you could ask, could this wave function have complex uh, and gamma? Sorry, gamma. Yeah, gamma is the Coulomb potential is the charge divided by k. And so you could ask, could this gamma function have poles so that I only keep this term, and then so that the wave function would decay and I would have a bound state in the Coulomb interaction? And the answer is yes. You can go now look at the poles of this gamma function. This time, these poles would be physical. You would compute the poles of this gamma function. They would give you this equal to an integer. You plug it into k square, and you get the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, which is exactly a, a way of computing the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. It's scattering an electron, past, and then seeing that the scattering matrix has poles. And if you look at the poles, you would get the wave function of the hydrogen atom. So it's not the way we usually find the hydrogen atom. Usually, we look for wave functions that decay and so on. Instead, we can do it by scattering an electron past, getting an object that looks like this matrix, looking at its poles, and then computing the binding energy for those poles, and they give you exactly the spectrum of the hydrogen atom with all the correct factors and so on. And that's written in, in the notes. You can, uh, you, can, you can check it there. So that's a cool way of rederiving the energy of the hydrogen atom. So in this case, it, it, was, it, it works. You can just solve it explicitly. You solve it analytically, and this is the solution for the scattering process. And you can check that things are, uh, are good in this particular case. To see where would be the dragons, etc., in higher dimensions is much harder. And uh, we would have to analyze it more carefully. So, should we stop for lunch? So, let's thank Patrick. Thank you.
So for people that don't know this, on the first floor there are tables and chairs that you can use whenever you want to, to, to study.